Hello, and welcome to the New York Wagner Society's 40th annual seminar on Die Fliegende Holländer. My name is Peter Phillips, and I'm privileged to act as your host and moderator for the seminar. As they say in the radio, I am broadcasting from my home in Montclair, New Jersey. Wagner loved technology, of course, uh, swim machines for the Rhine maidens and dimmable uh, auditorium lights and Wagner curtains and steam and disappearing frogs and all that just entranced him. And if he knew what we were doing this year, I'm sure he would be absolutely delighted. We are, of course, uh, learning as we go. And uh, I encourage everyone uh, to bring along, as well as their curiosity and erudition, uh, a certain uh, dose of patience and perhaps a sense of humor in case it may be needed. The Wagner Society does wish to thank all the many volunteers who put shoulder to the wheel to make this presentation happen. Uh, most particularly Griffin Kaiser, who is the chair of our program committee, and uh, both Mark Dichter and Michael Falco, who were instrumental in assisting us in the YouTube and, and other many procedures. Our first two speakers are both from Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts. Professor Hans Vage is a Professor Emeritus of German Studies and Comparative Literature at Smith. He has published widely uh, on the field of German studies from the 18th century to the present, with a particular focus on Goethe, Thomas Mann, and Richard Wagner. Peter Bloom is Professor Emeritus of Humanities and of Music at Smith. His teaching concentrated on the music of 18th and 19th centuries with a particular attention to Mozart, Beethoven, and Wagner, and his publications focus on Berlioz, Wagner, Schumann, and Debussy. With that, Professor Vashi. Hello, New York. Greetings to you all, and uh, welcome to my study in Northampton, Massachusetts. Uh, I want to thank Natalie, our president, for assigning to me the honor of opening our very first uh, web seminar. I wish this baby of the corona crisis a happy but very short lifespan. Let's all hope for a speedy return of the live and person-to-person -person seminar that have been highlights of our society's activities. My topic today is the Jewish connection of Der Fliegende Holländer. So let me begin by clarifying what it involves. Three factors come into play here. First, the author who provided the initial inspiration for the work, Heinrich Heine, was a fully acculturated Jew and Germany's foremost poet and most outspoken intellectual in the 1830s and 40s. In the eyes of the young Wagner, Heine's Jewish background in no way diminished his standing as a poet. Second, both Wagner and Heine viewed the legendary figure of the Flying Dutchman as a modern variant of the wandering Jew. And third, in 1850, Wagner went public with his anti-Semitism, a momentous detail of his intellectual biography that was bound to affect his perception of Heine. Before delving into my topic, I want to put my cards on the table and admit outright that I'm hopelessly partial to the Flying Dutchman. I'm aware of its imperfections, such as its idiosyncrasies of style, or the reactionary mysticism of the redemption through love message. In fact, Wagner's fourth opera, premiered in Dresden in 1843, 
strikes some Wagnerians as a poor cousin of the mature masterpieces in the Wagner pantheon. Nevertheless, to me, the dominant impression remains that of a breakthrough work and a stroke of genius, the first clear promise of the wonderful things to come. Three features in particular stand out. First, the very conception of the Hollander's spiritual predicament as die Sehnsucht nach dem Heil, the yearning for salvation, uh, raises the operatic tradition of the supernatural baritone to a whole new level of musical and philosophical characterization. Second, the figure of Senta is the first in a long line of extraordinary women in Wagner's work. Destined to become a bartered bride of sorts, she rises far above the ordinary commercial world of her father. Endowed with a mysterious power of empathy, she appears to foreshadow a modern sensibility, as Wagner put it, the woman of the future. And third, Wagner's vivid tone painting of a stormy sea mirrors and magnifies the storm-tossed existence of the Hollander and thus creates that pervasive nautical atmosphere that is the hallmark of this work. I have no doubt that my love of this opera was sparked by Wieland Wagner's stunningly realistic production, which, which I was fortunate to see in 1959. That was my very first Bayreuth experience. The performances of George London, Leonie Riesanek, and Josef Greindl completely wowed me. I treasure the memory of that gripping theatrical experience because it transformed what was a casual interest into an enduring fascination. How did Wagner become acquainted with the story of the Flying Dutchman? He first read it in the, the sophisticated shape that Heine had given it. Heine presents the story in one of his thinly disguised autobiographical prose narratives, facetiously entitled from the memoirs of Lord Schnabelowski. Here he mischievous, mischievously dons the mask of a Polish nobleman, Schnabelowski of Schnabelowops, in order to turn up his nose at the prudery and hypocrisy of the social milieu of Hamburg in which he had spent three years as a young man. The curious name of, for Heine's alter ego is meant to make the readers chuckle. It combines a Polish component, Bobski, with an unmistakably Swabian name, Schnabele. Both the aristocratic background of the mem and the memoirs themselves are fictitious. So is the dramatic play on the subject of the Flying Dutchman that Schnabelowski says he once attended at a theater in Amsterdam. We do not know when Wagner first read Heinrich Schnabelowski. He sketched his idea for an opera towards the end of a two-year stint from 1837 to 1839 as musical director at the theater of Riga and sent his sketch to Eugène Scrip in Paris, the librettist for Giacomo Meyerbeer, among others. Here we have Scrip. Wagner was hoping that Scrib would take the bait and turn his idea for an opera into a libretto, which then would elicit a commission from the Paris Opera. Once he had a foot in the door of the opera, so Wagner calculated he would be able to, con to conquer what B Walter Benjamin aptly named the capital of the 19th century and thereby achieve musical supremacy. His clever plan did not quite work out, however, and, as Peter Bloom will explain in a few minutes, he had to sell his sketch to a third party. Now, in order to get from Riga, uh, Riga today is the capital of Latvia, to uh, Paris, Wagner, Minna and Robber, their huge dog, traveled by sea. The three-week voyage in a small sailboat turned out to be a harrowing experience that helped shape the thrilling nautical character of the music as much as Heine's story shaped its 
plot. We have reasons to believe that, uh, that, he, that Wagner read Schnabelowski soon after it was published in 1834. At that time, Wagner had just completed his first opera, Die Feen, Heine Star, and Heine Star was shining brightly. He was the most glamorous figure in the movement named Junges Deutschland that provided the intellectual environment for Wagner's coming of age as an artist. Young Germany had two principal agendas, liberation from the political restrictions imposed by the Metternich police state and liberation from the strictures ruling sexual mores. Wagner's sympathy for the latter inspired his second opera, Das Liebesverbot, a comedy based on Shakespeare's Measure for Measure, culminating in a carnivalesque celebration of sexual freedom. In Wagner's autobiographical sketch, published in 1843, he proudly draws attention to the fact that Der Fliegende Holländer was inspired by Heine's description of that Dutch play, stating flatly that Heine's story provided him with everything he needed to turn it into a libretto for an opera. What specifically did Heine offer him? Which elements did Wagner use? Which did he refuse? He adopted the basic configuration of Heine's fictitious play, comprised of the two contrasting sea captains, one a merchant, the other a ghostly outsider, and of the merchant's extraordinary daughter. For Wagner, the salient point of the story was Heine's idea of redemption. Because of the Hollandist transgression, a vaguely Faustian act of overreaching, he is condemned, quote, to roam the seas until the day of judgment, unless he can be saved by a woman's fidelity. Heine provided an additional device that became a crucial motivating factor. Senta's fidelity unto death resolve was inspired by a painting of the legendary Flying Dutchman that she contemplates frequently and wistfully. In the terminology of the times, she is mesmerized by it. Here is an old postcard of the first performance. As always with Wagner, when he tells us about the genesis of one of his works, we need to pay attention not only to what he decides to reveal, but also to what he conceals and leaves out. As much as Heine's entertaining voice may have amused Wagner when he read Schnabelowski, as the creator of a grandly conceived romantic opera, he had no use whatsoever for any of Heine's ironic embellishments of the legend. He rejected everything that gives the story its vintage Heine flavor, especially the spoilers that are woven into his story. Those spoilers make a mockery of the allegedly elevating tale of redemption through a woman's fidelity. Referring to the merchant's daughter as Frau Fliegende Holländer, Mrs. Flying Dutchman, is one such flair. It signals the heavy odds against Mr. and Mrs. Flying Dutchman functioning ever as a couple. We are also told that in previous attempts to find salvation, the Dutchman has, quote, often been only too glad to be saved from marriage, to be rid of his redemptress, and to return on board ship. Heine's Dutchman, then, is less of a romantic hero than a modern existentialist, less of a redeemed tragic figure than a type of Sisyphus who embraces his fate and who, in the devil's name, will try again in seven years. The biggest spoiler, however, is attached to the high point of the play when the Dutchman's bride pledges to be faithful unto death. At that moment, Schnabelowski hears laughter cascading from the box above his. At the same time, an orange peel lands on his head. The laughter and the orange peel originate from an, from an exquisitely beautiful Dutch lady who throws him seductive glances to boot. Schnabelowski is game and, during the intermission, 
has a quick and satisfying erotic encounter with his libertine acquaintance, right there on a black sofa of the sort that were once one of the conveniences of taking a box at the opera. We learn that the lady with a frank sexual appetite lives in a fancy mansion by the sea, but occasionally comes to Amsterdam incognito in order to toss, an oran to, to toss orange peels on men she fancies and with whom she wishes to spend, quote, a dissolute night in the city, sometimes in the theater, sometimes in a dive fit for sailors. After this juicy intermission feature, Schnabelovsky returns to his box to watch the rest of the play. Clearly, he believes not a word of what he hears, having just illustrated by his own action the gaping gulf between the romantic ideals proclaimed on stage and the reality of contemporary social mores. He leaves us instead with a thoroughly disenchanting, even misogynist moral of the piece. Women, I quote, should beware of marrying a flying Dutchman, and we men should draw from, the, from it the lesson that women, at best, will be our undoing. Now, Wagner had no use for Heine's amusing spoilers. He eliminated everything that could cast doubt on the gospel of redemption through love. Irony and mockery had to make room for an unequivocal affirmation of the legend's truth as he saw it. The creative process at work here was one of restoration. If Heine can be said to have de-romanticized the legend, then Wagner re-romanticized it. Heine was in the business of disenchantment. Wagner's business was re-enchantment. By doing so, the Flying Dutchman acquired in, in Wagner's own mind a new character, that of an unmistakably German opera. As Wagner certainly knew, Heine was a Francophile, proudly declaring that he was not a German patriot, since patriotism had become synonymous with chauvinism. He lacked belief not only in the gospel of redemption, but also in the gospel of Deutschland, Deutschland über alles, and in the generally perceived panacea of national unification. Wagner, by contrast, after the failure to conquer, to conquer Paris, returned to Germany an ardent patriot. In his autobiographical account of 1843 that I mentioned earlier, he describes the three years of misery in the French capital and explains why he returned to Germany, ending with a solemn row, quote, for the first time I set eyes on the Rhine and with warm tears in my eyes, I, poor artist, swore eternal allegiance to my German fatherland. Thus, by cleansing Heine's story of all distracting elements and by restoring belief in its essential truth, Wagner thought he had uncovered its hidden German core. Re-romanticizing the Flying Dutchman meant Germanizing it. Here, a brief word about the question of intellectual property seems in order. Did Wagner, in popular parlance, steal the story of the Flying Dutchman from Heine? He certainly did not think so. Indeed, in the realm of creativity on the highest level, there is no such thing as theft, only variation and paraphrase. Likewise, the sloppy notion of influence is too blunt a tool to grasp what is going on between Wagner and Heine. The more correct term is appropriation. Wagner took up Heine's yarn, disentangled it, and cut off its modern embellishments, and thereby told the tale anew in a manner dictated by his own artistic goals and needs. Every artist proceeding in such a manner will claim, and rightly so, that by transforming the original, he made it his own. Let us now consider a particularly sensitive example of appropriation. Heine calls his doomed and ageless sailor the wandering Jew of the ocean. Wagner appropriates this moniker 
but uses the fancy Latin name for the wandering Jew, Ahasverus, referring to him as that Ahasverus des Oceans. Clearly, both Heine and Wagner mean the same thing, but given that the one is Jewish, the other anything but, the two characterizations do not signify the same. It is tempting to see Wagner's reference to the wandering Jew as an ominous harbinger of things to come. Here we see a characteristic image of the wandering Jew by Gustav Doré. In 1850, Wagner published anonymously his most notorious piece of writing, Das Judentum in der Musik, in which he outed his hostility towards Jews, Heine among them. This contentious matter is actually rather complicated and in the final analysis elusive. Evidence from literary history shows by the 1830s, Ewiger Jude, Jude and Ahasva had been secularized and universalized. Ahasva had become a code word for the restless, homeless existence of the alienated modern artist. It had shed its discriminatory implications, which explains why Wagner, himself a fugitive in exile, could recognize uh, himself in it. But did the legend of Ahasveros really shed its hostile overtones? There can be no denying that the myth of the wandering Jew, from its inception in the Middle Ages to the 19th century, had an unmistakable anti-Jewish thrust. In times of Jewish assimilation, that bias could be glossed over, but it could not be made to disappear entirely. At the heart of the legend lies a grave, irredeemable misdemeanor by a Jew, a husband, namely his refusal to show compassion for Jesus on his way to the crucifixion. A punishment, as punishment, he is cursed to roam the earth until judgment day, homeless, and unable to die. This, of course, echoes the larger Christian accusation made against the Jewish people that they were responsible for the death of Jesus Christ. In his great monologue in Act I, Wagner's Hollander describes his own fate in terms that clearly evoke the mythical figure of the wandering Jew as he yearns for the end of the world. Evidently, Wagner found this rationalization of the fate of the Jewish people plausible because he employs it again in Parsifal. The puzzling figure of Kundli, who goes through a chain of reincarnations, suffers a fate similar to that of the Hollander. Her guilt, incurred in an earlier life, consists of having laughed at Jesus on the way to the crucifixion. In accordance with the generally tolerant attitude towards assimilated Jews in the Young Germany movement, Wagner does not flesh out the anti-Semitic implications of the Ahasverus pattern underlying the story of the Fliegende Holländer. But he plants just enough seeds for a reading of the Flying Dutchman as a version of the wandering Jew for all those in the audience who are predisposed to pick up the hint and complete the thought for themselves. This anticipates the technique of anti-Semitic dark whistle that Wagner employs in his later works. In conclusion, uh, let us take note of the strange fate of Heinrich Heine in Wagner's mind subsequent to Der Fliegende Holländer. As we have seen, Wagner acknowledged his debt in 1843 when he wrote that Heine had given him everything he needed to fashion a libretto from the story of the Flying Dutchman. By the time of his full-length autobiography, Mein Leben, which he began in 1865 and completed in 1880, the name of Heine had been excised from the opera's genesis. Actually, however, the elimination of Heine dates from much earlier and is intimately connected to Wagner's uh, own intellectual and artistic ev evolution already in 1851, eight years after the premiere of the opera, in a communication of To My Friends, we see Heine vanish, as Wagner practically dispossesses him of the authorship of the story of the Flying Dutchman. Here, in addition to the wandering Jew, a new model is introduced, 
that of Homer's Odysseus, which removes the Flying Dutchman even further from his true origins. In order to make sense of that shift in Wagner's perspective, we must bear in mind that the communication to my friends was written in the wake of jewelry in music. In that highly effective self-advertisement that is the communication, Wagner reveals himself to be a total captive of his newfound convictions. He goes so far as to remove the name of Heine from his own biography as an artist. According to Wagner's theorizing in opera and drama, the Flying Dutchman could not possibly be the creation of Heinrich Heine because the story was, quote, the mythic poetic creation of the folk. Furthermore, in accordance with, with das Judentum in der Musik, a Jew, even as brilliant an exemplar as Heinrich Heine, was by definition incapable of tapping into the creative wellspring of the folk among which he is said to live as a stranger. It is tempting to dismiss such a foul brew of aesthetics and racism as one of the negligible idiosyncrasies to which great artists sometimes succumb. But thoughts have consequences. They may well pave the way for actions. This is especially true of cultural icons of the magnitude of Richard Wagner. His treatment of Heinrich Heine foreshadows in a disturbing manner what happened in Hitler's Germany when the Jews of Germany were marginalized and then excluded from society. I thank you for your attention. And now I pass the baton on to Peter. It is a pleasure to follow in the footsteps of Hans Vager, my friend and Smith College colleague, with whom for some years I taught an interdisciplinary course on the Meister. Hans knew all of Wagner and all of German culture. I knew the difference between G-flat and A-sharp. My assignment in these 25 minutes is to speak to the story of Der Fliegende Holländer as it intersects with France, which it does at two moments in particular, the difficult years in Paris and the post-Tristan period that includes the three famous concerts and the high drama of Tannhäuser at the Opera. The image on the screen appeared in Le Monde Illustré in February 1860 when Wagner was hoping for a performance of Tristan, a Théâtre Wagner, and perhaps permanent residence in Paris, which according to Heinrich Heine was the capital of Germany. It was during one of his own pioneering concert tours in 1843 when he gave monster concerts in Dresden that Berlioz heard Der Fliegende Holländer on the day of his arrival there and the second part of Rienzi, just before leaving town. He soon thereafter reported on his visit in the newspaper, the Journal des Débats, in a passage that would play a role in the creation of Wagner's renown in France. Because Berlioz, ten years Wagner's senior and the senior music critic for the French capital's most important newspaper, had a voice that loomed large. I quote the text that you see on the screen. As for the young Kapellmeister, Richard Wagner, who lived for quite a long time in Paris without having been able to make a name for himself apart from authoring several interesting articles published in the Gazette Musicale, he was able to exercise his new authority for the first time by assisting at my rehearsals, something he did with great energy and generosity. His swearing-in ceremony and his introduction to the members of the Royal Orchestra had taken place two days after my arrival, and I found him to be, quite naturally, in excellent spirits. After having faced in France a mountain of adversity and the unimaginable agony for an artist of professional obscurity, Richard Wagner now returned to his native Saxony, had the audacity to undertake and the satisfaction to complete both the words and the music of a grand opera in five acts, Rienzi, a work that in Dresden met with a brilliant success. There followed in its footsteps Le Vaisseau Hollandais, an opera in two acts, for which he again composed both the words and the music, on the same subject as that of the Vaisseau Fantôme, played a year ago at the Opéra in Paris. Whatever value you might wish to attribute to these works, you will surely admit that persons capable of successfully carrying out such a dual achievement, literary and musical, are hardly commonplace, and thus that Monsieur Wagner has given more than adequate proof of his capacity to cause others to notice and interest themselves in him. This is precisely 
what the king of Saxony has understood. Therefore, on the day he named Richard Wagner as colleague to his senior Kapellmeister, thereby providing Wagner with financial security, the friends of art everywhere might well have said to his majesty what the intrepid old sea dog Jean Bal said to Louis the Fourteenth on learning of his promotion to squadron commander. Sire, you have done well. Berlioz compliments Wagner on the orchestral colors of the score of the Dutchman, chastises him for an abuse of tremolo, praises his vigorous conducting, and then repeats himself on the matter of the magnanimity of the King of Saxony for having saved the life of a remarkable young artist. Berlioz's praise of the king is not surprising. The Frenchman was a lifelong monarchist and imperialist and had no patience for representative democracy. He and Wagner were surely not kindred souls at that point in time. In 1843, while Berlioz was highly impressed by the offer of a lifetime position from the king of Saxony, whom you see here, Wagner himself was skeptical. Court appointments are taken very seriously in Germany, he writes in Mein Leben. Most German musicians regard such a position with its lifelong tenure as the closest thing to heaven on earth, not apparently Richard Wagner. In his piece, Berlioz mentions the articles Wagner contributed to the periodical press. In the Wagner literature, these articles are not always correctly listed. Furthermore, despite the richness of that literature, no one has discovered with certitude the name of the translator of Wagner's prose into French. I emphasize translation because Wagnerianism, as a cultural movement, was, as you know, in many ways generated in France. Baudelaire, for example, whose remarkable essay on Wagner et Danoise à Paris got the ball rolling, knew the essay that we call Zukunftsmusik only from the French translation by Paul Chalamel Lacour, not as La Musique de l'Avenir, which you will read almost everywhere, but rather as a Lettre sur la Musique. The translation is not perfect, its importance and errors remain to be studied. Finally, in his piece, Berlioz mentions that Der Fliegende Hollander is on the same subject as Le Vaisseau Fantôme played one year earlier in Paris. This comment in particular needs elucidation because the relationship between the opera by Wagner and the opera played in Paris is tenuous. The operatic situation in Paris is the principal subject of what I have to say here. It is important to understand that from time immemorial, from the era of Louis XIV, the opera was both a government-run organization and a representative of the glory of the monarchy. Only after the revolution of 1830 and the installation on the throne of Louis Philippe did budgetary matters in the age of incipient capitalism begin to weigh on the treasury of the new regime. Louis Philippe determined to have the opera run as a private business although one that would continue to receive from the throne a generous subvention of approximately one-third of its annual budget. The director of the Opéra after the Revolution of 1830 was thus an entrepreneur who operated the institution at his risk and peril. The first such entrepreneur was a fellow named Louis Véron, whose girth suggests the prosperity of his tenure, which ran from 1831 to 1835 and which turned on the cash generated by Rossini's Guillaume Tell, Meyerbeer's Robert Le Diable, and Alevi's La Juive. Véron's collaborator, the architect and stage designer Henri Duponchel, whom you see here in a posthumous bust made in 1885, became sole director of the Opéra on Véron's retirement on September 1, 1835. On that day, the journalist and man of letters, Léon Pilet, became the royal overseer of the Opera. Four years later, on December 1st, 1839, a co-director was named, a government official named Edouard Monet. On June 1st, 1840, Monet replaced Léon Pilet as royal overseer, and Pilet himself became Duponchel's co-director. Finally, on June 1st, 1842, Léon Pilet became sole director and would remain at the helm of the opera for some five years. These names and dates are the results of my work in the archives of the Opéra, where the administrators never threw away a single piece of paper. My French wife takes after them. Here you see Léon Pilet in a caricature statuette made by Jean-Pierre Danton, known as Danton Jeune. I show it because Wagner came to know this fellow, and we ought to know how to pronounce his name. On the base of the statue, you see the image of a long-tailed crow, or magpie, which in French is une pie, and the image of a female wild boar, which in French is une laie, therefore pilet. 
as opposed to fie, the two L's pronounced as Y, as in Darius Mio. From Meyerbeer's Briefe und Tagebücher, we know that Wagner met Leon Pilet no later than August 1840, and we know from the autobiographical sketch of 1843, which Hans mentioned, that Pile told Wagner that he could not hope for a production of a work of his own for some four years, or perhaps it was seven years, as Wagner reports in Mein Leben, no doubt in poetic sympathy with the Dutchman's curse. It was Pile who thus purchased from Wagner the outline of his opera for the sum of 500 francs, a sum roughly equivalent at the time to the cost of an inexpensive piano, to Berlioz's income from five articles for the Journal des Debats, to five months' rent. You may recall that in Mein Leben, Wagner mentions that on the day after Christmas, in the same year of 1841, he came home to his wife carrying a goose with a 500-franc note in its beak, a gift from a friend of his sister Louise, then married to the Leipzig publisher Friedrich Brockhaus. Here you see the receipt that Wagner signed in July 1841. It reads as follows. Je soussigne déclare abandonné à Monsieur Paul Fouché et Révoile le sujet du Hollandais volant, moyennant la somme de 500 francs, que je prélèverai sur les droits d'auteur, que pourront produire la représentation de cette pièce ce vendredi 2 juillet. The undersigned hereby cedes to Monsieur Paul Fouché et Révoile the outline of le Hollandais volant for the sum of 500 francs, which I shall deduct from the author's royalties that we will be produced by the performance of this work. On this Friday, July 2nd, 1841, you cannot see the year, but it is indeed indicated on the document faintly and in another hand. Now, first of all, who are these people? Paul Fouché, whom you see on the left, was a respected playwright and literary critic who happens to have been the younger brother of the woman in the center, Adèle Fouché, who married Victor Hugo on the right in 1822. Benedict Henri Rivoil, for whom I have no image, was a poet and translator of novels from both German and English. In 1842, he suddenly left France for the United States and became associated with James Gordon Bennett, the founder of the New York Herald, by that time the most important newspaper on these shores. Then, who actually wrote the text of the receipt we have seen? Some time ago, Barry Billington noted correctly that the document is distinctly not in Wagner's hand. But Isolde Fette, editor of the score of the first version of Der Fliegende Hollander for the new Wagner edition, claimed that Millington's conclusion was almost certainly untenable. In fact, Millington was right, for as I discovered, the document is in the hand of the man who encouraged Wagner to sell to Pilet in the first place, Edouard Monet, the royal commissioner whom we have mentioned. Hundreds, if not thousands, of Monet's letters are preserved in the archives. One of them has the phrase, ce vendredi, on this Friday, set down just as it is on the page that Wagner signed. The letters V and D and the spaces before R and I are identical in both documents. That Monet was present at the transaction is not surprising. Indeed, in an undated letter he sent to Monet, or clearly written in June 1841, Wagner practically invites the government official to draw up an agreement such as the one we have seen. The future tenses used in the little contract suggest that payment was to be made only after the French opera had been put on the stage. That eventual French opera by Pierre-Louis Ditch opened some 16 months later on November 9, 1842. It is from the daily payment registers preserved at the Bibliothèque de l'Opéra that we know that Pilet did indeed pay Wagner 500 francs in July 1841, just as Wagner indicates in Mein Leben, where he speaks of the lump sum paid by the theater cashier as an advance on any author's royalties. This was a rather daring move on Pilet's part, and it was not the only one because Pilet was, was known to yield to pests, as another administrator put it, and to make verbal commitments for works which he feared had little chance of success. But even the normally cynical Berlioz called Pilet a gentleman, which in Berlioz's writings is a rare compliment indeed. Now Berlioz was far more aware than Wagner of the intrigue that was common to the Opera's administration. He had suffered a thousand deaths during the production of his own first great opera, Benvenuto Cellini, or Malvenuto Cellini, as you see here, 
premiered in the autumn of 1838. In 1841, commissioned by the same new director, Léon Pilet, Berlioz prepared recitatives and a ballet for a new production of Weber's Der Freischutz, because at the Opéra, spoken dialogue was strictly verboten and dancing was a sine qua non. Berlioz's version was premiered at the Opéra on June 7, 1841, only four weeks before Wagner signed away his scenario for Der Fliegende Holländer, and it was staged some 60 times over the next five years. On two successive Sundays, just before Berlioz's Freischutz opened, Wagner published articles on Weber's opera in the Revue et Gazette Musicale, in which he praises Berlioz as the best man to fit the German national opera to the French stage, but nonetheless regrets the decision to Frenchify and fancify the work by means of recitatives and ballets, which he says will only succeed in denaturing it. A month later, he sold his sketch to Léon Pilet. In German, the sketch is the Prosa Entwurf. In French, Wagner referred to it as Le Sujet, or La Minute d'un Opéra. This is the document drafted in Wagner's inimitably calligraphic hand that the composer had originally hoped would be versified by Eugène Scrib, the most famous librettist of the day, as Hans mentioned. We know that Wagner also offered to communicate to the eventual librettist and composer all of his ideas regarding the performance of the work, both musical and scenic. In fact, the eventual opera produced by Dietsch and Fouché is only tangentially related to Wagner's outline, based as that eventual opera is, largely on The Pirate by Walter Scott, published in French in 1822, and on The Phantom Ship by Frédéric Marriott, published in French in 1839 as Le Vaisseau Fantôme. I should like to read the first few lines of Wagner's French draft to show that despite his own rare self-deprecation and despite comments from the modern biographers, Wagner's French, the language he began to study in Mittau in the summer of 1839, as soon as he had definitively decided to escape to Paris, was by 1840 not all that bad. Le Hollandais volant, nom d'un fantôme de mer. De nouveaux sept ans sont passés pendant lesquels le Hollandais, c'est d'après la tradition des marins, le Hollandais volant, a erré sur les mers sans repos et sans pouvoir atteindre son dernier jour. De son sombre vaisseau, dont les voiles d'un rouge sanguin et l'équipage de spectres sont l'effroi des marins dans les eaux étrangères, il descend aujourd'hui sur une des côtes de l'Écosse. The Flying Dutchman, the name of a phantom of the sea, once again, seven years have gone by during which the Dutchman, or according to maritime tradition, the Flying Dutchman, has been wandering upon the high seas, able neither to rest nor to die. Today, from his darkened vessel, whose blood-red sails and ghostly crew are feared by all sailors in foreign waters, he comes ashore somewhere along the coast of Scotland. This is only a tiny sample, but in Wagner's French text here and elsewhere, there are only a few trivial spelling errors, nothing at all grave. In that French text, as opposed to the German draft, <clears throat> which was clearly made subsequently to the French version, the characters have as yet no names. The Dutchman is le Hollandais, l'audacieux, l'étranger, or l'inconnu. Daland is un marchand écossais bien riche, or le riche père. Senta is la jeune fille, and Eric is un jeune homme bon mais pauvre, or son jeune amoureux. The French outline is furthermore considerably less detailed than the German outline. In neither the French nor the German outline is there the slightest hint of the final transfiguration, the appearance of Senta and the Dutchman rising in heavenly splendor above the sea. Wagner completed the score of the opera in October 1841 and the overture in November. But when precisely did he conceive this coup de théâtre, which, by the way, is not found in Heine? We know from the new critical edition of Der Fliegende Holländer that the new musical ending, the so-called Tristan ending, because it makes use of a plagal cadence similar to the harmonic progression at the conclusion of Wagner's great score from 1859, was added only in 1860 for Wagner's three concerts in Paris in January and February of that year, when the overture to the Dutchman was on the program. The, er the ending <clears throat> of the overture to the Dutchman was thus adjusted then, 
and so too, obviously, was the end of Act Three. The stage directions at the end of the opera are another matter. These underwent revision each time the score was revised or printed. The original stage direction at the end is this. Senta and the Dutchman, both transfigured, rise from the sea. The illustration you see from the production of the opera in Munich in 1864 would seem to incorporate that original stage direction. However, the final stage directions become more elaborate as time went by, even though a musical incarnation of these final directions, the final Tristanesque chord progression, was tacked on only in 1860. Here you see the final stage directions as they appeared in 1860. I need not take the time to read them, but the emphasis on the dazzling light is new. What I am wondering is whether that final stage direction was influenced by the ending of the French opera, by Dietsch, where the last stage direction, as you see here, refers to a luminous apotheosis. I am also wondering if this notion was given to the French production team by Wagner himself who, as I mentioned earlier, was originally happy to sell not only his scenario, but also his ideas of how to put the work on the stage. Now, it is clear that Wagner never saw Dietsch's opera, which, as you see here, is now available on a naive CD made about five years ago by Mark Minkowski and his Musicien du Louvre. Because the German composer left Paris in April 1842, Dietsch's opera was premiered in November. But we know that Wagner was aware of it because he says as much in the letter he addressed to the Berlin journalist Johann Schmidt on the 9th of January, 1843. There were numerous reviews of the Dietsch in the French press, and Wagner might well have come upon some of them. In none of them, we should emphasize, do we find the name of Richard Wagner. In his review of the Dietsch, Berlioz cites the humorous moral of Wagner's primary source, Heine's Schnabelwapsky, which Hans has mentioned, namely that women ought to avoid marrying flying Dutchmen, and that men ought to know that even in the most favorable circumstances, women may cause them to sink. Berlioz's description of the final scene of the Dietsch is only slightly less cynical. Hardly has the phantom ship disappeared in the watery depths with its ill-fated captain aboard, that we see a cloud gently rising from beneath the waters and lifting the souls of the faithful woman and her husband up unto the sanctuary of celestial beatitude. Now, in the notes that he prepared in 1852 on the proper performance of Der Fliegende Holländer, Wagner insists on the scrupulous coordination of action and music. That is something he continued to insist upon for some time to come. Such literalism is no longer in fashion, of course, but it does still have its place. If Siegmund does not look into Sieglinde's eyes at the precise moment we hear the opening of the glance motif on the dominant of the key of B-flat major with a suspension in the solo cello ushering in the chord, one of the most heartbreaking of all of Wagner's leitmotifs, then something Wagner presumably would have agreed is lost. It is this kind of literalism that, that appears to have led him to add the Tristan Schluss to the Dutchman. He did this in January of 1860, when in Paris he was preparing those three concerts here at the Théâtre Italien in the Salle Ventadour. Hans van Bulow had arrived in town in mid-January, partly to assist Wagner to copy out the parts for the concert. At that very moment, just prior to January 19th, when his major preoccupation was finding a proper ending for the concert performance of the Prelude to Tristan, which he considered the singularly most important item on his program, Wagner modified the coda of the overture to Der Fliegende Holländer. You will surely remember that Wagner, almost un unlike almost every other composer in the history of opera, wrote the Prelude to Tristan not after having completed the opera, but immediately upon attacking the score. The prelude, of course, comes to no clear conclusion, but leads directly into the opening of the first act. Now, having completed the opera in August 1859, he wrote to Mathilde Wesendonck to say that in the Tristan prelude, he wished to foreshadow the ending of the opera as a dawning presentiment of redemption. 
The desire to foreshadow redemption is surely the reason that Wagner also modified the ending of The Dutchman. As he wrote to a friend, I have recently composed a better conclusion to the overture, which lends to the larger entity a more holy character. Einen weifolleren Charakter. For Paris, Wagner had had to imagine a concert ending for the prelude to Trista. That is what you see here. In Paris, where he had written Der Fliegen to Hollander, he went back to the drawing board because of Tristan and tacked on to the Hollander what we now know as the Tristan ending. These are only two examples of the complex relations Wagner entertained with the French capital. We sometimes forget, but Paris always played an outside role in Wagner's creative life. As he wrote to the translator of Tannhäuser six months after the three performances, it is odd, but I tell you truthfully, that I feel an almost patriotic nostalgia for Paris. Despite all the misfortune that I have endured there, I have found many people whose interest and confidence in me are so ardent that I feel in my heart almost obliged to complete the task I undertook and to share with the Parisians everything that I should like to do and everything that I am capable of doing. Thank you for your patience. We are delighted to be able to speak today with uh, two of the artists of the recent Metropolitan Opera production of Die Fliegende Hollander. We have with us Franz Josef Zeli, who is a bass and undertook the role of Davant. And also with us is David Portillo, who took the role of the Steuermann, the, the steerman who had such a impact on us uh, at the very opening of, of the opera. Thank you both very much for joining us. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Franz, great pleasure. Franz Josef, uh, I suppose it's just after dinner your time. You're in Germany, is that right? Yeah, that would be the time usually, yes. Yeah, yeah. Around yeah. And you're, I guess with uh, David, we're just before lunchtime where we're, uh, we're reaching you in St. Louis. Is that right? St. Louis, Missouri today. Yes. And we're, we'll get some lunch after this. <laughs> okay. I, I hope that you're both well and that your families are well. Yeah. We are doing well. Thank God. Yes. Good to hear. Unfortunately, it has been necessary before one begins any conversation these days to hope that the person you're speaking to is well and that their loved ones are well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, let me just start off with Franz Josef, if I may. I, I confess that I find the role of Dahlen to be uh, very difficult to follow. Uh, it, it seems that he's a, a perfectly well-off man with a, with, you know, with a happy family, and uh, someone comes up to him and asks if they would sell him his daughter, and he says, sure. Now, <laughs> I, I'm sure it isn't that simple, but it so frequently comes across that way. What's this guy about that he would, at, at such liberty, go ahead and say, oh, I love the amount of money that you have here. Take my daughter. Um, maybe the, the problem, his problem is that's not such a happy family. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think Santa is quite strange and she's often asked by Mari, for example, not to tell again and again this story of the Dutchman. So uh, her father will know as well. And it is typically in Wagnerian base roles, uh, uh, in, in the base characters, that you have a daughter, uh, there's nothing said about the rest of the family, never said anything about my wife, so her mother. It's also the same in Meistersinger for Veit Bogner with Eva. It's in Tannhäuser for Landgraf and uh, Elisabeth. And it's like the same also in, in Beethoven's Fidelio with Rocco and Leonora Fidelio. Um, so this is quite strange, I think, first for our times that uh, there is always a father with a daughter that has to be, yeah, that that he wants to be married to a good yeah, relationship. Yeah. And, um, and especially here in, uh, in the Dutchman, I think it's quite, he's, he's waiting quite long to find someone. Um, <laughs> so in other words, he, he would have taken even less. <laughs> uh, yeah, he, he would have taken the, the hunter, hunter Eric, yeah. He, 
but it's not his first choice, I'm pretty sure. And when he sees this Dutchman, he forgets everything else. He's only focused on these jewels, uh, or as we had now in, uh, in our new production at the Met, that it was like in with this rock, with this little, uh, like glowing. a special energy that he, that the Dutchman brought into this community. Yes, that was quite an interesting choice, wasn't it? Uh, I, I'm happy that you put a name on it because if you put a, a gun to my head and said, explain what just happened, I'm not sure I could. But uh, David, you call it a glowing. A, um... mm -hmm. I think the way uh, uh, Jean-Francois put it was it was a glowing energy of mysticism or something like that. There was some, he, we wanted to, think that there was uh, a lot of value in it, obviously, because it is treasure, but it's also hope and, you know, and um, there's, there's something very mystical about it. And I thought that was a good way to put, you know, it's not that just Dalant was going only after money, but right. he was going after this mysticism that he didn't understand that was hooked that he was. I, I think he was quite, yeah, I wouldn't say that he was depressed, but it was, in his yeah, usual life and then with his daughter and everything. And he was longing for something, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the, I think that the strangest uh, 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 thing is that she is always talking about this Dutchman and then when he arrives, nobody knows that and recognizes mm -hmm. him. So uh, this is, but this is opera, yeah. <laughs> well, it is. I suppose we can say it's opera, except we don't have to enact it, and you do. And I really yeah. admire the extent to which you really thought this through, so it makes sense for you. Yeah, I, I, I have to say, I from the uh, from the first day on, I liked the idea not to have a, a proper jewelry uh, big box with everything gold and silver uh, to have this new idea, but the more we got on stage, I thought it was not easy to transport it, yeah? Because this huge house and you have, uh, yeah, this glowing stone or whatever it, it looks like. Uh, some people said it looks like a purse um, if you hold it the wrong way. So it was not that easy, I think, to understand what it means. Right. Right. It, 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 in, in, a, in a way, if you accept it as a mystical source of energy, a good thing, a, a, a purgative uh, thing, yeah. then maybe we're having to entertain the possibility that uh, the Dutchman is not the only one who is in need of redemption and that uh, Holland needs something spiritual as well. This is, I think this is the, the, one of the, the important things that uh, everybody needs it. Yeah, the, the idea. So also this longing uh, for redemption, a Dutchman, a Dutchman is bringing something that also is necessary for everybody else. So in this way, I thought it was very, yeah, very human and very uh, interesting uh, view of uh, Francois. No, that's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. David, what was it like? Was this the first time that you sang Sturman? Yes, it was. Yes. I, I'm amazed that this is the that, that that got to be my first experience. But yeah, I was very lucky. Why? Why? Why did it surprise you? Did you think that you would have met that role earlier in your career? Yeah, I mean, at least been able to sing the music, you know, in concert version at one point or in a smaller house. But of course, you know, there's not a lot of American houses that get to do the Fine Dutchman. So I was very lucky that this new production I, I could be a part of. Yeah, you must, I, I must say that from my own ear, which is only my own ear, I have not heard that role sung with the lyricism or the lightness or the directness, I guess. You came across as a sailor who had been <laughs> out to sea for quite a while and were while. very eager indeed nice. to, okay. to meet cool. his girl. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a, uh, I think that that sort of redemption quality also really kind of goes with the, the music and the singing that's happening in the very beginning, which seems very simplistic and very lyrical. Um, and then really when that tune at the end of the first act turns into a kind of a militant loud roar by the chorus, right. it kind of is amazing how it's changed so much over that one act. 
because you're watching this sort of redemption happening, you know, while, while it goes on. And that's kind of what I thought was cool about the story on music is that he was a part of everything with the chorus uh, of kind of like showing the simple and human part and then into the, uh, oh, this turns us, this gives us this hope and this mysticism and this is, this is now changed. Oh, what a cool insight, the two of you. You see, I'm, I'm, ready to, uh, I'm ready to end the interview right now, seven times more wise than I was when I began 10 minutes ago. <laughs> well, we also sat in rehearsal and just tried to think of stuff that it would be <laughs> well, <of laughs> that course. was, that was yeah. smart for us. <laughs> yeah, we, we've all, I mean, anybody who's ever performed has been in the position of saying, well, I have to do this now. How does it make sense? Yeah, yeah. Make okay. it make sense for you. Just briefly, outside of Fliegende Hollander, you played David in Meistersinger in the Glyndebourne production that was directed by uh, McVicker. And I, if, if I can just ask, that production uh, introduced me to the relationship between Zox and David that was in no sense uh, a healthy one. It seemed right. uh, physically abusive yeah. and that David learned from it lessons of abuse himself. It, it reminded me of a kind of hurt people, hurt people. And mm -hmm. I, I wonder what your sense was of fitting into that production. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I definitely feel like that relationship was always important to kind of, um, to kind of also show how the relationship between um, all the singers and their apprentices was very important. There's such a difference. And I think that all the Meistersingers had a very um, um, rash way of treating their, their apprentices. And it was all, they all had different kind of relationship. But with, I feel like with Dafit, there was so much more of a, like a genuine uh, respect and love, even though it was tough love, even though it was sometimes abusive, but it was always meant for, the right reasons and you know Zox always turned around and gave him the opportunity to to uh to to do things that he wasn't able to do that kind of moved the story along and in the end you know they they kind of found that that redemption by his own by him being kind to yes David. yes and in, in fact uh, David in in the quintet it's a wonderful epiphanal kind of thing to realize I'm going to be okay now. I'm going to be I'm getting to marry. Yeah. 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 Not just to marry, but to be a, be a, be a citizen, be a That's, person, right. have, my, have my own trade. And uh, yeah, there's a really beautiful moment in that production where Zox holds the hands of both Afa and David at the same time. And, and, you know, it's great to like, it's a little surprise and it's also like, well, no, of course, you know, he's, he's letting me, letting me go off to do my own thing, which is great. Yeah, yeah quite wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, the first time, uh, Franz Josef, that I saw you perform Daland, I was in the Bayreuth, and I believe it was the first season of the, of the new production. The production that I think it just closed, didn't it? The, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, then when I saw you do the same role in the Metropolitan Opera, I thought to myself, this guy, <laughs> I mean, Bayreuth is by comparison a shoebox. And mm -hmm. here he is singing in this vast barn. Do you make adjustments either psychologically or physically before you walk on in Bayreuth or before you walk on at the Met, knowing where your voice has to go? I think uh, very important is for me always uh, when I came to the Metropolitan Opera is the psychological uh, um, effect not to give too much but it was in Bayreuth almost the same in the first I remember the first uh, uh, stage orchestra rehearsal I gave too much because I heard I thought I heard hear the the orchestra so loud because of these how it is built, uh, you get the, the, the orchestra volume first, yeah, the, the whole sound on the stage. And then uh, my Sutileman said to me, your voice is big enough, give 65% and then you're fine. Yeah. And I remember there are stories of Cosima telling telling people that during the festivals of the of the eighteen nineties. Yeah, be it's quiet, be quiet or be quiet. Yeah. In Bayreuth it's very important, especially when you're far in the front, because otherwise it's going uh, to make 
some yeah, noises or something. And, uh, and at the Met, also when you climb up this huge ship, it is always taking, yeah, takes self-control. Don't overpace, don't give too much. Uh, but for sure, you give more, a little, a little more than in other houses. Yeah. Simply because of the size of the house. Of the size of the house, and and you can, yeah, trust. You have to trust that it is working. But it's hard to believe when you go on stage, and probably you're a little nervous or so. So, uh, it's it's a, a question of self control. Yes. Yeah. You, did you have the same experience at Glyndebourne, David? Uh, yes, same thing. I think with Glyndebourne, definitely, because the the first time I sang Dafit, I did that same production in uh, Chicago at the Chicago Lyric Opera, which um, I, I think is is longer and way taller, especially than Glyndebourne. Uh, but for an American house, it's it's not as um, I think acoustically, you're all you, directionally you have to go out, and uh, in Glyndebourne, we just felt like it was a, a beautiful you know, jewel box of a theater because you, you don't have to, um, you can actually sing, you know, a little bit toward the wings a little more. You can be a little more attentive on stage. It was a, it was a much better theatrical experience for the singers, I think. Um, and, and yeah, the Met is overwhelming to look at. So then that's the first thing you want to do is just give, but you have to trust the acoustic. Like this is the thing. Like and, and may I add that, that also in the set of our new production at the Met, it it was different if you sang, had to sing from the ship above, as we did uh, together in, in, in the first act, or then in the second act, we were very far, I had to sing my aria from, yeah. Halfway in the middle of the- It, it, it yeah. was like in the next house, yeah, or from <laughs> rehearsal stage, the yeah. feeling. And also when I heard from outside, uh, it was a big difference, like uh, um, standing on the first part of the rocks or more behind, yeah? Mm -hmm. And that was one of the problematic things of our new production, I have to say. Yes. Mm -hmm. there, was no, there was no wall, there were no pieces that you could actually use to, for the acoustic. Yeah, it and it was a big empty space. But then when I was really lucky, because I feel like I sang all my stuff really up on the ship, so I, didn't have as much of a problem because it's just acoustically it was yeah. an easier place i guess so if you could find how to do it from there you found how to do it for the whole role yeah kind of because everything was up there yeah, yeah. yeah. and the rest you know, of it, it became difficult then in 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 far in the back yeah. mm -hmm. i was lucky enough to see the production early in its run and i sure was lucky because the rest of the run pretty much ended up getting canceled now, everyone in New York and in everywhere else in Chicago, they canceled the ring and, and all of these audiences are sitting there saying, woe is me, how disappointed I am. I assume there were nothing as disappointed as you are. I, I, I know, uh, Franz Josef, that you had some uh, uh, King Marks coming up at the Royal Opera House, didn't you, that were canceled and some Fidelios both at the Met and, and tonight, at the- uh, yeah. in, Tonight. In Tonight I would be singing in Chicago with the Chicago Symphony and Maestro Muti, uh, second of four concerts with Beethoven Ninth Symphony, yeah. and it's it's all gone. It's all gone. It's uh, really disappointing and very sad. Now you were supposed to be doing uh, with Esa Pekka Salen on uh, King Mark in Los Angeles. Is that still putatively scheduled for October or not? It, it is not yet cancelled. This is one of two things. For the whole year, rest of the year, that's not cancelled yet. Well, it, 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 it's a sign of the times, isn't it? Instead of saying it's going forward, we're saying it's not yet cancelled. It's <laughs> yes, not yet cancelled. That's unbelievable. We hear and, that a lot from the, from our managers nowadays. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah and, and David, I, I should think that it, there's a there's a, a triple sorrow for you because you were really I I think you must have been in rehearsal for the world premiere of a Tobias Picker opera. Yes, yeah, so I would have gone to rehearsals right after the the end of uh, the end of the the Flying Dutchman. 
Yeah. So there we're, we're missing not just a gig for the artists and not just an opportunity for the audience, but uh, an and... event that happens very rarely in American opera, which is a composer receiving a world premiere of his work. Yes. Yeah. I was emailing with Tobias recently and uh, of course, the, you know, he's, he's upset about it. He's, um, there's always going to be these future possibilities, but then he of course also was um, very sad about the singers who are involved in the production, who don't get to kind of use the, the things that they've already learned. We had workshopped it a couple of times. So um, it was, it was too bad that we weren't able to, to do the world premiere. I want to remind uh, our uh, listeners and watchers that uh, PBS is going to be airing this Metropolitan Opera production of Die Fliegende Hollander uh, on Sunday, the 5th of July. Uh, I encourage everyone to check to see what time uh, in their particular locality it's being, it's being done but you'll certainly have an opportunity to see Franz Josef handling his energy, uh, his yeah, bundle of, of mystical energy. And you will see uh, David up on the prow of the ship, not having to worry about the acoustics at all, if I've listened <laughs> to this right. Still trying to sing loud. <laughs> <laughs> I thank you both very, very much for your kindness. And uh, I appreciate the, the uh, pleasure, frankly, that you give to us by your, the generosity of taking part in something like this. I, I hope that you, we get back to normal soon and that we have more opportunities to delight in your artistry. Thank you. Thank you thank so you much. And all the best to everybody. And yeah, stay safe and healthy. To close out this first part of our seminar, we're fortunate that Joe Pierce, the president of the Vocal Record Collectors Society, has rejoined us for the topic, Centers Known and Unknown. Uh, Joe can always be relied upon to convey aspects of vocal performance in Wagner that open our ears and at the same time also open our eyes and our minds. Uh, Joe Pierce. Good evening, this is Joe Pierce presenting a portion of the Fliegende Hollander seminar called Centers Known and Unknown. Uh, by way of explanation, I am only playing one version of the ballad uh, because I think the soprano's voices we'll hear tonight are better demonstrated with excerpts from the end of the second act duet and from the third act uh, finale. Uh, we're going to start with the great Kirsten Flagstad, who for most people uh, would be considered the greatest Wagnerian soprano of the century. She did not sing center very often. And interestingly enough, she sang it at the Met eight times in the late 1930s, but none of those performances were broadcast. And just uh, through serendipity, it happens that she did a broadcast of the opera with Herbert Janssen as the Dutchman from Covent Garden in 1937. And from that, we are going to hear the end of the second act duet, followed by the little trio that technically ends the act in which she and Janssen are joined by Ludwig Weber. And then we will hear the final portion of the opera uh, sung again with Herbert Janssen. Here we go.
Second selection will be by the wonderful Swedish American soprano Astrid Von Eye. Interestingly, when Rudolf Bing came to the Met in 1950, his first two productions, new productions, were of Don Carlo, which is very famous, and of Fliegen der Hollander, which has been pretty much forgotten. And supposedly they were scheduled for the great Luba Valish to sing, but something happened and she never did sing the role at the Met. And they gave it to Astrid Von Eye, um, who went on then to not only sing it at the Met several times, but at Bayreuth in 1955. She is a very powerful uh, center, more so than needed possibly, but uh, it's very impressive. And she sings the finale to the second act duet with Hermann Ude.
third singer will be soprano Ingrid Björner from Norway. Uh, Björner had a major career all over the world for about 35 years, but sang at the Met intermittently, singing there in nine seasons, but only 48 performances in total. Uh, n none of those performances were of center in The Flying Dutchman, but she sang the whole panoply of uh, Wagner soprano roles in the course of her career. The recording we're going to hear is from an RAI Rome performance of February 2nd, 1969. It is the finale of the third act of the opera, and her Dutchman is the much underrated Franz Kras. number four will be Center's Ballad as sung by Helen Traubel. Now, many of you will know that Helen Traubel never sang Center in her life, mainly because she refused to sing it. She said she could not picture herself wearing a dirndl. But she did get to record the ballad for RCA Victor in 1950. Uh, Traubel was basically Flagstad's uh, replacement, let's say, for want of a better word, at the Met for the next 10 seasons after Flagstad went back to Norway. Anyway, here is her victory recording of Santa's Ballad.
fifth selection will be sung by Maria Miller. Maria Miller was a Czech German soprano who had a marvelous career in Germany, but everybody forgets that she was also a star at the Metropolitan Opera for 10 consecutive seasons, uh, singing 196 performances uh, of a wide repertoire of both Italian and German roles and uh, mostly the lighter Wagner uh, soprano roles. She also was the Maria in the American premiere of Simone Bocanegra in 1932 at the Met. Uh, Miller is heard here at Bayreuth in 1942, and she had sung at Bayreuth since 1930, uh, singing uh, the finale to the Act Two duet, followed by the little trio uh, with her father. And her assisting artist here, Joel Berglund, as the Dutchman and Ludwig Hoffmann as Daland. <laughs>
Our sixth selection will be Center as interpreted by Leone Risenek, who was arguably the most famous center of her time and possibly the most famous center that ever lived. I mean, she owned the role from the early 1950s into the 1970s at the Met, where the Dutchman wasn't all that popular in the old days. She sang 32 performances of it between 1960 and 1970. Um, this is from a La Scala opera performance in 1966. It is the Act Three finale, and she sings it with once more Franz Kras, who we just heard in the Ingrid Björner recording. And I tuned into a Met Opera broadcast of Dutchman with Nina Stemmer as center, and I was mesmerized. I thought it was absolutely the most perfect center I had ever heard. And fortunately, she recorded the opera about four years later for Shandos. It was done in English, but that's all right. You won't understand much of what she sings anyway. But the uh, Dutchman is John Tomlinson, who is really a stupendous Dutchman, and the Eric is Kim Begley. This was recorded in January 2004 for the Shandos label, and it is the entire finale to the third act of the opera, and I think it's a perfect way to end this part of tonight's presentation. Thank you. Oh, send the harvest, take the door.